Welcome to day 11 of the advent of code. Today's puzzle reminded me of Conway's game of life. <laughs> We have a little grid with floor, uh, empty seats and occupied seats. And we have rules that govern how we get from one grid configuration to the next grid configuration. Right? So the first rule says if a seat is empty, like all these seats, and there are no occupied seats adjacent to it, which is correct for these seats, the seat becomes occupied. So all these seats become occupied in configuration number two. And then the next rule says if a seat is occupied and four or more seats adjacent to it are also occupied, the seat becomes empty. Okay, let's see. So for example, here for this seat, we have one, two, three, four. For this seat, we have one, two, three, four, five. And for this seat, we have one, two, three, four. That's why these three become occupied. Uh, I'm sorry, empty, and the others stay occupied. Okay, and then f this is the last uh, configuration. The, the uh, following configurations remain the same, basically, right? So we have reached a steady state. Okay, in case this confuses you, for part one, we use four, and for part five, <laughs> part two, we use five. Okay, cool. Um, now, checking eight neighbors is uh, trivial for all the cells in the middle, so to speak, because they uh, really do have eight neighbors. But what about the um, edge uh, cells or even worse, the corner cells, right? They only have uh, five neighbors or even three neighbors. And in my limited experience with implementing Tetris clones, I learned that if we pad the input or the grid with additional spacing, for example, another line above here and another line below, then these special cases disappear and every real cell has eight neighbors. Okay, and here I prepared this, this uh, pad function that should do exactly that. So first of all, Let us compute the width of the layout. That would be the index of the first line break. In our case, that would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which is exactly the width. That sounds um, correct and useful. And then we generate a string consisting of that many spaces by using the Java 11 repeat method of the string consisting of a single space and then that many times repeated. Okay, and then we concatenate um, spaces with a line break, then the uh, normal layout, then spaces and a line break. And the layout contains a final line break. That's why I don't add one here. Okay, that works in almost all the cases, except the top left corner. And for the top left corner to also have uh, a neighbor at the top left, we need to add some additional dummy value here. I chose the backslash m. Okay, cool. So that would be the padding. Let's see if that already works. Oh, I misspelled index of, in dead of. That should be index of. <laughs> okay, and here you can see uh, the additional padding above. And at the end, you can see the additional padding below. Okay, so that already works. So let's concentrate on the successor function now. How would we approach this? So first of all, I have to compute something which I call the stride, which means uh, given any position, how do I get at the neighbor exactly below me or the neighbor exactly above me? That's one more than the width. Um, and we can simply look again. Uh, inside our grid for the backslash n. Uh, <laughs> I chose that as the first dummy character, so I really have to start here. Maybe that was not the best choice, but we can start at index one, that's fine, right? And then it would find uh, this backslash n and the number of characters in front of it is exactly um, the stride. Okay, let me know if you, f if you know a better name than stride. <laughs> I don't even know where I remember this from. Computer graphics, I think. Okay, then the relative neighbors, what are they? Let's store them in a vector. So basically that would be uh, for the middle, that's trivial. That's just minus one and plus one. Uh, for the row below, that would be, uh, let's add minus one and the stride. 
let's add <laughs> zero in the stride for symmetry and let's add a plus one in the stride, right? That's um, uh, bottom left, bottom and bottom right. Okay, and similar thing here, let me copy paste. I just have to uh, change the pluses with a minus because then the stride is subtracted instead of added. Okay, so that should be the relative coordinates of the neighbors, that's looking good. Okay, and then we need a function, let's call it occupied, that takes an absolute index and then loops over the neighbors, that's a hard word to spell. And um, I want to filter for the neighbors where the occupied sign is found at the um, position of the grid, at the absolute base plus the relative offset. Okay. Um, and what do we return? We can return anything. Let me return the, um, the value from the neighbors vector. I'm simply going to count the values that remain in the sequence here. So it doesn't really matter what I return. Okay, cool. Does it compile? Yes. Okay, cool. So that would be that. So now let's loop over all the indices in, uh, in our string. Oh, I used the wrong parents here. I don't think there's an easy way to fix that in my IDE. I hope I got it correct manually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we store the, again, I did the wrong thing. We store um, the cell that is at that index, right? So for now, you could say, why don't you simply loop over the characters in the string? Why do we loop over the indices? That's because we need them as a base for the occupied function above. Okay, cool. So now we loop over all the indices. We have our cell, so we can simply case over that cell. And the interesting cases are the empty seat, the occupied seat, and otherwise we can simply return the cell. Um, okay, so what do we have to do in this case? We have to count the occupied seats. Okay, then we get a number between zero and eight, and now we could do a map lookup or an if or whatever. And I think um, an interesting solution for mapping small integers to characters is to simply use a string and say, uh, well, let me show you like like this. So for, for each of those inputs from zero to eight, I simply put the corresponding value here. Okay, so for for zero, I want uh, the occupied seat and for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I want to remain empty. Okay, and of course I have to call this <laughs> char at, right? So this is a nice trick, mapping small indices to characters. Okay, and we can do the same thing down here just with a different string. So the root set uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, let's see if this compiles. It still compiles. And maybe now it's time to um, check that. Let's see. So uh, here's our normal string. What uh, is the output if we compute the successor? Ah, okay, now we have a lazy sequence of characters. So we have to turn that into a string. We can do that by saying string join. Okay, then we get this string, right? Where all the L's have been replaced by pounds according to the rules. And what happens if we compute the successor again? Yeah, then some pounds turn back to L's. That's looking good. Okay, so how do we now iterate the successor function? We want to do that uh, multiple times. You already know the iterate function. So we want to iterate successor over the starting value um, pad small, basically. Okay, so we should get now an infinite sequence <laughs> of successors and the wrapper only prints the first hundred. And you can see here is uh, the first one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and number six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on seem to be the same, at least from a first visual glance. So why don't we simply always compare adjacent pairs for um, equality? And as, as long as they are not equal, we want to keep them. And as soon um, as they become equal, we want to stop. Okay, 
you already know partition or good old friend <laughs> we want to look at pairs that are one apart right we do it like this here you can see now the pairs and now we want to take while and then given a predicate for those uh, pairs so a function that destructures the pairs and says when they are not equal uh, then they are interesting okay let's see how many remain here so one two three four five five pairs okay so um the next one was um stale basically here's still a small difference okay so and we can even count this uh, and then we get five Okay, but we're not interested in the uh, number of different configurations. We're interested in the last configuration. So let us look at the last pair. And then inside the last pair, let's look at the last configuration. And here we should count the number of occupied seats. Okay, so that would be filter for the equality with occupied. Uh, let's see. Yeah, then we have a sequence of, of <laughs> occupied seats then we can count those and we get 37 that's correct for the small one let us see how efficient that is um, so the time macro gives you the result and also tells you how long it takes so in our case that's natural natural net <laughs> it's fast <laughs> uh, okay okay so now let's try it with the large and I think PewDiePie also has uh, great problems pronouncing negligible correctly. <laughs> I can train that while the program runs. Ne negligible, negligible, negligible. Okay, still running. So this takes quite a lot of time, um, 16 seconds. And I want to show you a quick way to speed this up. So the biggest reason why our solution is so slow is Java interop. So these functions with a leading dot are just Java methods that we want to call. So on the grid object, we want to call the index of method and pass these two parameters. And here on the grid object, we want to call the char add method and pass this parameter and so on. So what does the closure compiler do? So for example, here for this interop call, the closure compiler says, well, this is a string, of course, so I'm simply going to invoke the char at method of the string class. Right? That's, a, that's a, maybe a handful of JVM uh, instructions, and the I think it's invoke virtual that actually calls uh, our char at method here for you JVM experts. Okay, but here the compiler doesn't know what the type is. Right, closure just knows this, this is some kind of object, so the index of call happens via reflection. So every object that has this index of method will work here, not just string, but also, I don't know, your own class. <laughs> That's the benefit of dynamic typing. It simply works by being existent <laughs> in the type, the method. Okay, but if we say, no, 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 we know that this is a string with this type hint, then the compiler will simply cast the grid to a string and then also emit the invoke virtual um, bytecode. Okay, and this should make it uh, quite a lot faster. Let us see. Yeah, now we have about a third of a second instead of 16 seconds. Right? So about a speed up of 50 times, not 50%, but 50 times. <laughs> so if you're sure that you only accept strings here, then it makes perfect sense to use these type hints for performance reasons. Um, you could also argue, hey, this is cool from an API perspective. Now the caller knows what he has to pass in. Yeah, it, it, has, uh, uh, it has also benefits from API perspective, but you constrain yourself to the string type. Um, other types won't work. I think you will get a class cast exception or something. <laughs> Try it out and let me know in the comments what happens if you pass something else. Uh, I don't think the compiler will catch that. Okay, cool. So that's a, that's, that's a cool speed up. So now let's go to part two. Um, in part two, the, um, the algorithm for checking the neighbor changes. So for example, here we checked uh, our immediate neighbors. And in part two, we say, well, if the immediate neighbor is a flaw, then we check the next neighbor. And that if that is also a flaw, mm. right? We, so we ignore the flaws. We, look at it at a direction and not pick the seat directly in the direction right we look in the direction 
um, for a seat that is either occupied or empty. And also the, the four changes to a five. Okay, so how would we do that? Um, maybe let's start fresh here. So I, I experimented a bit and the best solution that I found used a good old uh, loop recur. So I said, let's start another uh, variable that adds i and j. So basically the, the immediate neighbor, if you will. Okay, and then we store the cell that is at that position. Uh, wait a minute, what did I do here? I forgot. <laughs> like this, right? <laughs> okay, and then we check if there is an equality between the dot and the cell. So if you can look over the floor, basically, and if that is the case, we recur, add another j to k, and then uh, otherwise we compare as before uh, to the occupied. Okay, um, yeah, let's see if that compiles. That compiles, and we should change this l to an occupied, right? Because now we need uh, one more according to the problem description. Okay, let's see what happens if we ex execute this. We get 1865 and that is correct. Yeah, okay, cool. So maybe let's do a quick uh, recap. So here the performance is not so critical because we only execute pad a single time, but uh, why not, let's do it. <laughs> okay, so whenever you know um, the type at compile time and you want to make the Java interop faster, <laughs> 10 times or 50 times faster, then use those type annotations. Um, yeah, and then here the repeat method is a Java, L, uh, Java 11 string method. Uh, if you don't have Java 11, how would you solve it otherwise in Clojure? <laughs> Let me know in the comment section. Then the screw function, I think you already know this. Yeah, this was just the trick with the additional padding. Okay. Um, yeah, then see another very important type annotations to speed up those Java interop calls. Uh, then this subtraction was, was was a bit finicky for me. I'm just not used enough to the prefix notation probably. <laughs> then this loop recur inside the when of a four took me some time to get right because it's just an unusual placement, but it's I think it's much more readable than the higher order function alternatives and it's also quite a lot faster. I measured that. Yeah, okay, let me clean this up. Okay, then the string join function is quite nice. Uh, if you don't know that string join exists, you will probably write apply still call, and that's exactly what string join does for the um, single argument arity. Okay, um, right, and then this cool trick where we say we want to map from a small integer uh, to a character, then you can simply use a string and say for zero, I want this character, for one, this, for two, this, and so on. That's, that's a nice um, trick to have. Okay, then the time macro is sometimes useful to see if your optimizations are uh, good or bad, but you can only use it in these drastic examples. So uh, the, the me measuring JVM performance, especially in micro benchmarks, is uh, is harder than using a single macro. <laughs> in Java, you would use JMH, the Java micro harness. I don't know, is, is there something similar for closure? Let me know. Okay, and then here the take while was new where you can cut a potentially infinite sequence uh, given a predicate and the last is good old functions, iterate, partition, filter, and so on. Yeah, so um, I would be especially interested how you solved part two uh, do we have a more elegant solution or a more interesting solution? Again, let me know in the comment section below. Bye.